Whoops. Thank you. Please feel welcome to have your camera on or off. Totally your preference. This meeting is being recorded just for your information. The chat is off right now, but we'll turn it on later during the meeting. I love the picture of Ravenna with a horse. I need to know no, more about that. So nice to see familiar faces and new friends. Thank you all for being here. o'clock so we are going to go ahead and get started this is a great time to check uh check your monitor to make sure that you are muted so if you could do that we've got a great rock and roll family here i can i can hear them can't wait to see them go ahead and, and mute um mute ourselves and i'll jump right in I have disabled the chat um, only because um, I'm on a solo mission tonight. And so I want to be able to be present for the presentation and then um, we'll open the chat up for, for questions. And you know, there are so many questions right now, but thank you all for being here. I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, this is our school district's presentation, orientation, customized for Maplewood Parent Cooperative for the 2021-2020 school year. You'll notice that um, many of the slides are in uh, English and Spanish. We do have a um, interpreter available for Korean as well. Please let me know. Um, if that's something that you would like. All right. So language interpretation. Uh, I'll, I'll start the meeting by recognizing that this is it's a text heavy presentation with lots and lots of slides, which is good because that means that um, there's some consistent messaging happening across our district. Um, also, there are some some Maplewood nuance, nuances going through here. So tonight we'll be talking about um, the interpretation I mentioned available. The meeting is being recorded. We'll have our land acknowledgement and school information, as well as 
kind of a day in the life of your student in COVID health and safety protocols. And again, time for Q&A. And this is a great time to check to make sure you're muted. I do want to acknowledge that we acknowledge the original inhabitants of this place, the, the Sohobish people and their successors, the Tulalip tribes, since, who since time immemorial have taken care of, hunted, fished, and gathered on these lands. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and we honor their sacred spiritual connection with land and water. By acknowledging these homelands, we commit to working with tribal nations to further the educational aims they have identified in our classrooms and in our schools. For our families who are multilingual, I'll give you a chance to look at this uh, same verbiage um, in Spanish. We wanna make sure we're uh, providing information in the languages of our families. So welcome. Uh, our sign out front is Maplewood School. Uh, we are Maplewood Parent Cooperative and we were established in 1983. So back before probably many of our, of our family's uh, parents were, were born, um, but it started as a group of parents of preschoolers who really wanted their children to have that cooperative experience going into elementary school. So they made a presentation to the school board and that model was accepted. And each year we grew a little bit at a time. So by classes, by grade levels, and ultimately until we had our middle school. Back in 2018, we had another change in the cooperative and that we merged um, what was Maplewood Center, uh, an educational facility as for students with special needs. We merged into the co-op. So we're all one happy family now with kids of all different ability levels. I think it's always important to, oops, back one, Michelle. Uh, always important to know a little bit about the people who, um, who we're with. So this is a little bit about me. Um, family is first, it's my top priority. So the co-op is a, is a good fit for me because I believe in family and family engagement. So here we have uh, my immediate family, uh, my husband, John, and John and I have been together since we're, we were 17 years old, uh, making googie eyes at each other in Spanish class, which is probably why neither of us are speaking uh, Spanish fluently these days. But uh, John and I have been together 34 years. And this is our son, Brady, who is 23. And Braid just graduated from Seattle University. He worked for the Pike Place Market Foundation uh, during a summer internship, so hence the pig. Um, my parents are super duper important to me. I am first generation college uh, attendee and graduate, so that's a big deal in our family. Uh, this is preparing for their 50th wedding anniversary where we had their hands molded and bronze sculpture kind of thing. Uh, we love to travel, especially to warm climates. Uh, this is my brother, along with my husband. He's my best friend, very uh, good guy. And I think his shirt says it all, life is good. Um, my mom is an elder in the Snoqualmie tribe. So again, very important to me to have that land acknowledgement. Also uh, the cedar tree, because it's part of our history, part of our family's legacy um, with our family business. Uh, this is our dog, Buster Douglas, and uh, Buster Douglas plays a pretty huge part in our wow. lives, especially wow. getting up at 4.30 every morning. Uh, when I am not at school, I'm probably gardening or riding my horse, Smack. And we are the Maplewood Orcas. 
we strive at Maplewood to learn all of the names of our children and our families. It's been especially hard over the past 18 to 20 months to learn students' names. This is very important to me, and I had an opportunity to have an informal tour with students today and to promise them that I would get to know their names before the end of the month, September end of the month, not tomorrow end of the month. It's also important to me to be outside at arrival and dismissal uh, whenever I can so that the kids can see me and I can talk with them. So at our school, all means all. Some general information about the first day of school, September 8th. Our kindergartners will begin September 13th, and that allows for time for the kindergarten teachers to have connection meetings with families between the 8th and the 13th. Um, I'm not even <laughs> looking toward the end of the year. I'm so happy that we are able to have uh, our kids back in school that I just, I can't wait to see them. So a little bit about um, our school. We do have two, essentially two teachers per grade level. And we have some new teachers this year. Ms. Cragen is one of our new teachers. She'll be teaching second grade. Uh, Mrs. Johnson will start off as a substitute for sixth grade. And sixth grade families, I'll be sending you more information tomorrow about this. Mrs. Cessna is also new to our school and she'll be teaching learning, uh, learning support in the resource room as well as uh, primary PE. And Mrs. Hogue has changed from second grade to resource room. So she'll be helping students who are learning to read, uh, who might just need a little bit of extra support to get going. We are a K-8. Uh, we do run block classes for our middle schools. Our humanities is social studies and English. And those classes are taught by Ms. Mitchell, seventh grade, and Mr. Brick, eighth grade. Mrs. Wortley and Mrs. Baldock both teach mathematics. We offer four different sections of math for our students. And science, um, I was able to hire a middle school science teacher today. We just need to uh, get that paperwork submitted and, and rolling so that we can make that announcement, but very excited to um, announce a new middle school science teacher. And also uh, our beloved Mr. Barton, uh, while he will be teaching online, he'll be stationed here at Maplewood. We have three primary intensive, excuse me, we have three intensive support classes. Uh, we have a primary class, an intermediate class, and both of these are geared toward children who are medically fragile, so have special needs and <clears throat> for their cognitive abilities, as well as special needs for their health care. In the middle school, we have Ms. Garber, who is teaches intensive support. And these are, um, these are our friends, our kids who are um, possibly have cognitive delays, may have an autism spectrum disorder. Kids are kids, we are here for all of them. A little bit a uh, day in the life of a student at Maplewood. For families who were here prior to March 2020, uh, our kids would come from the carpool or come from the bus and they would assemble in the commons. We can't do that anymore because there wasn't a lot of room for social distancing in the commons. So um, for the time being, the kids will meet out front and then we'll all come in uh, essentially together, but socially distanced staggered um, at 9-10. asked to talk a little bit about drop off and to show you a picture. Um, <laughs> I don't have a picture from a drop off since 2020, uh, March of 2020. So this big space here is the carpool line or carpool lane, excuse me. And essentially, um, if your student is not riding the bus, then we do want uh, you to enter at the west side of the campus and follow the carpool lane, which is that yellow curbing. 
do ask that students are independently able to exit the vehicle on the passenger side. This keeps them safe. We don't want them exiting on the driver's side because there are cars that are going by. Adults stay in the, in the vehicle. Don't worry. Um, we, we've gotten pretty good at this and we strive to know the parents, the vehicles that you drive, and so that we can make eye contact, making sure our kids are going home with the right people. Uh, I used to use the, um, now it's very outdated, but the uh, Gorge analysis, analysis um, if you went to a concert at the Gorge um, 20 plus years ago, there were no lights. So you really had to follow the herd. Um, now there's a lot of lights and definitely more, uh, more safe transports there. But um, please don't pull around the car in front of you. Uh, we wanna just kind of follow that train. Uh, sometimes kids and families aren't always using the crosswalk, although we strongly encourage them to do so and have staff out there. Um, very important that we keep our kids safe. The pickup process is essentially the same as the drop off. We'll do, we will help your kids get into the car if they need help. If your child's not yet independent, no problem. Find a place to park. And I do recommend that you back into that parking space because our parking lot can get a little bit, uh, a little busy. And frankly, I can't wait for it to get busy because that means we're back doing what we're supposed to be doing. There are different levels of PPE uh, worn, in our, worn at our school by our staff members. And this is really dependent on the kids that they work with. So for many kids, um, teachers and staff members will be wearing masks, fabric masks, or three-ply medical masks, just like uh, they do. For some of our staff members, they're going to need um, a different level of protection because the children they're working with are learning how to wear masks. I put a note in here um, that there'll be areas outside designated for mask breaks even though we've been going on this pandemic for you know, close to 20 plus months. Um, I know that my endurance has increased for wearing a mask, but certainly uh, I need a break during the day and I imagine that our, our kids need breaks too. This is a picture of a classroom. This is actually a sixth grade classroom from a hybrid in the spring. So students will have assigned seats and we have tried to distance uh, for three feet, but uh, honestly, it's, it's really tough. Um, we can get close to that in the kindergarten, first, second grades, but when we get up to the fifth and sixth grades where we're talking about 29 kids per class, it gets tricky. So um, just wanna be fully transparent on that. We are trying and also enforcing the mitigating factors like hand washing, staying home when sick and uh, not sharing supplies. As we go into this school year, we really wanna focus on social emotional learning as well as the academic learning. It was noticeable to me when the kids came back in the spring that they, they really just needed time to talk with each other, time to be with each other, to be kids. And we want to provide them that space along with helping them grow academically to be their best selves. Recess, uh, super important. You saw a little bit about me. Um, I'm an outside person. I love to be outside and busy. And recess is uh, one of my favorite, favorite subjects. Uh, we will have a uh, two recesses per day for the kids in kindergarten through sixth grade, a 30 minute recess adjacent to lunch, and then a 20 minute recess in the afternoon. Most of our staff members uh, provide some type of wiggle break or go for a walk in the mid morning, just to kind of break up the day. We wanna get the kids out, get fresh air, get some water and really um, prime ourselves to be ready to learn. This is a picture of the commons. Um, prior to COVID, kids in kindergarten through sixth grade ate lunch in their classroom. 
Uh, now things are different and we will all eat in the commons. Uh, there was a great question from a new kinder family about, you know, why would we group so many kids in the commons? That didn't seem, you know, seem kind of contrary to popular uh, thinking. And the reason for our kids to be in the commons is because we actually are better able to space them apart and to sanitize between lunches. So those, that's the reason why the kids are eating in the commons. We will get outside as much as possible. So if the weather's nice, we're picnicking at the, at the sundial. I did make a notation here, it'll come up later on in the meeting also, um, that breakfast and lunches are free this year. Um, I do encourage everyone to complete, or everyone who feels they might be eligible to complete the um, application for free and reduced meal services, because that does open up opportunities uh, for scholarships such as College Bound. This is just a fun little collage of what, um, what learning has looked like. We do have a beautiful butterfly garden here uh, where the kids, um, there's some plants that attract uh, butterflies and in prior years, the second grade kids have been able to uh, let their butterflies go in this little garden as part of their science unit. Um, got great friends here. These kids are actually older and they're not at Maplewood anymore, but um, just represent that, that fun time of being together. The Gaga Pit is very popular with kids and we'll get that open up as well. And then gardening club is also something that the kids enjoy doing. So here we have some, some flats that um, look very well weeded. Right now they look a little bit different. I do wanna put in a plug for Right at School. Right at School is uh, an organization that provides before school and after school childcare on site. Um, information will be in our news flash to help parents who are interested get connected with right at school. We're getting into some pretty heavy text, so I do want to just reiterate that this meeting is being recorded. And also the slide deck has been posted on our schoolhouse website. So you know, all of this is, is going to be accessible and I am more than happy to answer questions or to try to answer questions to the best of my ability. Uh, I think one question that, that came up often is, what are we going to do if there is um, a COVID diagnosis uh, at, while the children are at school? And so this slide takes, talks a little bit about that, that we will revert to remote learning if there is an entire classroom or school um, that needs to be, have quarantining happen. Attendance, uh, I made a note here, uh, there is no perfect attendance award, and that's for good reason, <laughs> because if your child is not feeling well or presenting any of the COVID type symptoms, we really want you to keep your child home. Um, the kindergarten teachers and I joke that um, we promise not to believe everything your child says that happens at home. If you promise not to believe everything they say that happens at school, uh, it's always um, a little spot of humor in the day when the kiddo comes to school and says, my mommy said I have a temperature and she gave me some peach stuff and it tastes good, but I don't feel well still. <laughs> um, so kids, they, uh, they like to share a lot with us. The Chromebooks, uh, jumping from COVID symptoms to Chromebooks. Uh, the Chromebooks will go home with the kids each day, and that's just in the event that we do have to go into a quarantine and remote learning, your children have their Chromebooks accessible to them. Talked a little bit about health and safety already. Uh, primarily, we want masks as one of the mitigating factors, as well as social distancing and hand washing. And of course, as I mentioned, stay at home if you're feeling ill. There is a very comprehensive COVID-19 handbook on the district website and then also on our schoolhouse website. 
Uh, what I like about the resource on our schoolhouse website is that there are some, some bullet points uh, that call out specific important items from the, from the COVID handbook. Um, primarily, you know, the, those mitigating factors, wash your hands, stay at home when you're sick, all of that good stuff. In the spring, we, uh, we did have uh, testing daily with attestations that needed to be confirmed prior to students arriving and being allowed into the building. That's different this year. Right now, there are no uh, attestation forms that the children will need to be uh, completing or their parents need to be completing. But we do want you to make sure that you're checking for those symptoms and staying home if someone might be ill. And here are some of those symptoms. Fever, cough, shortness of breath, chills, unusual fatigue, muscle and body aches. New onset headache, sore throat, sudden loss of taste or smell, congestion, unrelated to seasonal allergies. A little hard to separate that out, but um, we'll try our best nausea and vomiting, and diarrhea. The custodians have been very well trained for, sanitize, for disinfecting and sanitizing the spaces around the school. Um, so that is something that we are uh, definitely on par, ready to go. There's the daily maintenance as well as the in the event of where we need to really go in and do some deep cleaning. Had lots and lots of generous uh, parents offer to buy air purifiers for our classrooms. And thank you, that's very kind of you. Actually, the, um, the HVAC systems across the district in all of our schools are running 24 seven. And uh, with that in mind, uh, bringing in an air, an air purifier or, or a fan or something like that, it actually does have more of a negative impact on the overall airflow because the HVAC system is set up a certain way. And when we introduce a barrier or another instrument, uh, then it doesn't work as effectively as it can and should. So thank you, but no thank you. Talked about hand washing. I'm going to uh, allow you to uh, enjoy the video on hand washing at a time that works best for you. And also, if you have a question about the proper way to wear a mask, there is a video uh, for that as well. We found that in the spring, uh, when the kids came back for hybrid, uh, wearing a mask was second nature for a lot of the kids. And um, kids that we thought might have trouble learning to wear masks really didn't have that difficulty. It just became part of their routine. Um, this is the slide where I stop and look, tears come up, up in my eyes a little bit in that um, right now our school um, and schools across the district have limited access to staff and students only um, volunteering and being part of our children's lives at the co-op is, is why we're here. It's why we're together. So um, be thinking about the kinds of talents, skills, abilities that you have that you might want to share. I think, <laughs> I saw one of my friends from the earlier tour. Hi, Charlotte. Um, we, we have lots of needs for, um, for partnership. Uh, this can be working on something at home for a, a teacher or staff member. This could also mean sharing your, uh, a bit about your cultural, cultural experiences and backgrounds, particularly if you are multilingual, love to know more about um, you know, what your thinking is on sharing that, um, that asset with more of our students. We have a small middle school with uh, about 114 kids all together. And with that, we're just not able to run uh, the high school world language classes the way some of the larger middle schools are. What we can do though is uh, really work with our parent partners to uh, give them an introduction to language. So some of those introductions have included Mandarin, uh, 
Korean, Japanese, French, and Spanish, and sign language. I really would love, love, love um, to get some Maplewood Spirit gear ready to go. So if you are a family member who um, is strong with uh, graphics, uh, please reach out to me. I'd love to get um, get some clothing sales going for um, for us, just to, again, build that community up again. Our colors are blue, white, and black, and it's been about three or four years now since we've had spirit wear. So these are not meant to be a fundraiser um, at all, but just meant to break even and uh, available for families to, to share their Orca pride if that's something that they're inclined to do so. Here's a strong recommendation um, for vaccination. All of the state employees who work at schools uh, do need to be uh, vaccinated with the second dose prior to October 2nd. So I can share that at Maplewood, we are in good shape and um, I don't see a huge impact to our staffing because of this. COVID testing is available. I did want to point out that um, COVID testing is only going to occur with permission from the parent or guardian. This is not something we would do independently. This is only by permission from the parent or guardian. We love our performing arts. Uh, it's been hard not to have the middle school musical the past couple of years, hard not to see the kids um, putting together their, um, their play during conference week. Uh, the arts are important to, to us, to our school. Uh, so right now, what we, what we do know is that when kids are singing in music, which singing and music go hand in hand, um, the kids will need to wear three-ply medical masks. Uh, those will be provided by the schoolhouse, by the district. For our musicians, for our fifth through eighth graders, there are actually special masks for uh, students who play woodwinds and brass instruments. And then there are also horn covers. Fall athletics uh, are just about underway for our kids. At Maplewood, we have cross country in the fall for students in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So I really encourage everyone to take a look at that news flash that typically comes out on Wednesdays uh, because that's where you'll find the most up-to-date information about um, what's happening in the schoolhouse. Information about buses. This is where I'm gonna skip ahead real quick here. Um, for families, if you have changed your mind, maybe when you've completed that intent form in August, you weren't sure if your child would ride the bus, but now you're feeling like this is going to be a good resource for our family. Um, I strongly encourage you to go to the EduLog Parent Portal app. And um, again, this will be in the news flash as well as posted on our website. This is a uh, kind of real just in time information for families. I mentioned earlier in the presentation that there are free breakfasts and lunches for all students. This is a great resource. Right now, the menu is a little bit limited, but as more food service employees are hired uh, and we get more established, then the menu will expand. Financial support is available through um, completing the federal free and reduced meal application, also through the Edmonds Foundation. And at Maplewood, we are really blessed to be able to help one another, take care of one another. So if there is a need, you're not sure about you know, school supplies, uh, not sure how to pay, pay for school supplies, um, please let me or Ms. Sison, our school psych psychologist know, because we're happy to help out. There's been a little bit of a delay in communication with school supplies uh, in that we're, we're not sure exactly what um, our district resources will be. So some of the classroom teachers have gone out and gone ahead and put out a kind of a, a skeletal supply list. 
of more information about financial aid. Skyward, um, this is really an amazing resource when the information is up to date. So please, please, please make sure that your information in Skyward is correct, especially your contact information and the contact information of someone uh, who could help your child in the event that you're not available. Um, Skyward is also a great place to see your secondary students' grades, uh, bus information, and uh, past report cards. Really, it's just this huge comprehensive database that it only works when the information entered is correct. So please make sure you uh, take care of that if necessary. Uh, and Mid School District is hiring, especially in food service and bus drivers. So I encourage everyone um, who's interested or may, who may know someone who is interested to go to the district website and take a look at the different uh, available positions. With that, I am going to stop the share and open the chat. Also, um, you know, please feel welcome to unmute yourself and um, ask that question. I will try my very best to answer for you. Okay, I see a question. I don't see a name. I see an iPhone and a question. And it looks like we have, let's see, you're wearing purple sleeves. And I am Allison. Allison, are you? Okay, Allison, are you my, Anthony's uh, little sister? I kind of did a big problem with my Hema computer because I just tried to, to figure out it, but I clicked one of the apps by accident, but then I have a big problem. Okay, what's your problem? I just kind of click on something that that would not have an X. Okay. So Allison, how about if tomorrow Mrs. Mitchell or I call you and talk through your specific uh, challenge, uh -huh. and then we'll also put information on in the news flash about uh, who families can contact if you're having those tech troubles. Allison, great job starting us off with questions. Mm -hmm. Way to go. Mm -hmm. First graders rule. All right, some other questions. Can I ask a quick question? Absolutely. Yeah. My name is Bob. I'm the father of Sienna, who's uh, a new student there at Maplewood. Well, new, but new, but not new. Last year was her first year. So uh, I've been hearing from a lot of experts on TV, the, the uh, COVID experts, the importance of keeping children in smaller pods within a school, meaning uh, not mix keeping them sort of in their own class group or, or maybe a combination of classes and not mixing kids school-wide. Are, are we looking at doing anything like that? Or is that, is it, how, how much exposure will each kid get to kids from other grades and, mm -hmm. and other teachers? Yeah, great question, Bob. Thank you for asking. So we will try our best for cohorting so as the kids are seated together um, in the commons for lunch, they'll be seated with their classmates. When we get into, um, it's a little bit easier for our kindergarten through fourth grade kids and our kids who are in the intensive support classes. Uh, but when we get to like fifth and sixth grade and we're talking about band and orchestra, things start to muddle a little bit. Also in seventh and eighth grade when they're changing classes. Uh, but we are, we do recognize that cohorting has its place. And uh, we were successful last year with cohorting on the playground, having different zones where classes would play. As uh, the student intervention coordinator and I were talking today, it's gonna be a little bit more tricky because we have two thirds the amount of kids that we did it in the spring. So um, there are places where we absolutely can I can't promise that that's going to be everywhere, though. That's where we get that hand washing and masks and distance and all of those mitigating factors. Thank you for asking, Bob. Hey, Michelle, I got a question for you. Yeah, hi, Jeff. Hey, how you doing? Okay. 
Good. Hey, I wondered if you could talk a little bit about the first day of school. I'm, I'm curious, since parents won't be walking into the building, if the staff is going to come out or how are we going to help the kids get to and find their classrooms? Great question. We'll take an all hands on deck approach. <laughs> so classroom teachers, um, I, I would imagine that they will be at their doors greeting the kids uh, the way they typically do. Uh, but instead of coming from the commons, we'll be coming from out front. Um, there'll be many paraeducators, myself, our student intervention coordinator, probably members of the office staff out there with our stylish orange and yellow uh, vests helping guide kids in by groups. So we might say, um, you know, all right, I have a group of sixth graders. We're headed down. Please join us. Um, it worked in it worked in the spring, but again, you know, that was a third of the population. So um, we're going to have to get creative. Uh, we've been doing uh, tours for kids who that might be new to Maplewood or maybe just feeling a little bit apprehensive about coming back to school. So if your student is you know, not quite sure and they've got that nervous twitch in their tummy, please reach out, um, let me know, and we can put another tour together. I think we had about 20 kids today come through and just give them the overview. You know, This is your classroom. This is where you'll have lunch. Here are the bathrooms and <laughs> those important things uh, that we just need to know for human nature. But okay, gonna... Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about our boy who was virtual all year last year. And so yeah. he'll be walking in for the first time in first grade. And I want to make sure that he has help to find his classroom. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a quick question. Yes. There we go. Can you hear me? Yes. <laughs> um, I am Nicole. I'm a parent of Noah, who'll be a fifth grader, and Sophia, who's intensive support um, second year. And they both were new to Maplewood, yes, last year, but neither of them have been in the school. So um, having an intensive support kiddo, she's medically complex. And I guess one of my questions is around um, when a sibling is ill, um, would we automatically, if you're developing any sort of symptoms, you know, if she's running a fever or something, should both siblings be home um, automatically or would we be okay to still send the non-symptomatic child? It's really a decision for parents to make. At, at this point, I'm inclined to err on the side of caution. And if, if one child is running a fever and presenting, you know, other COVID-like symptoms, um, Again, I'd rather err on the side of caution and say let's let's monitor at home for 24 hours to see if that if the fever you know goes away or you know something changes. But there isn't a hard fast rule, which just learning that there are really very few hard fast rules. <laughs> so we're having to make a lot of judgment, and um, like I said, I tend to tend to err on the side of caution. Okay, yeah, um, I mean, as a, both of my parents were elementary school teachers and I'm a pediatric nurse at Children's. So it's like, I tend to err on the side of caution as well, but I also know from the part, my parents being educators that there would be issues with attendance. So is that kind of being um, a little bit less like frowned upon this year um, in, the face of COVID, if like, I know there's a certain point where you get a letter that, you know, your kid has been gone too much. Um, is that still happening? Because I know that kind of deters sometimes from keeping a kid that you're just questionable actually home. Right, good question. Um, the, the policies and practices around attendance changed pretty dramatically last year, changed a few times pretty dramatically. Um, I, in this particular slide toward the beginning, there is a link about attendance. Um, you know, one or two days, 
we can make that work um, and provide students with their the materials. You know, there's there's no no way to really replicate the in class experiences that kids have um, or don't have when they miss school, but we can provide the materials. So again, I'd err on the side of caution. I think the kind of the the tricky thing for me wearing my principal hat is. Um, you know, sometimes families are able to uh, take vacations during the school year, and and that's certainly a family's prerogative. Um, I'm really, um, I would say, I'm a strong advocate for taking vacations during the scheduled vacations whenever possible, and and sending kids to school when they're feeling well. Can can I just jump in just real quick? My two cents. Um, especially with the Delta variant being, I mean, probably one of the more contagious viruses we've run across. I, 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 what I've been told is it's a pretty safe rule of thumb that if somebody in your household is exhibiting symptoms or, or has tested positive, assume everyone in the household has it, that, that you may not be symptomatic, but you're carrying it and you're able to carry it to somebody else. It would be, it would actually be somewhat difficult to live in the same house with somebody who has the virus and somehow not get it yourself. Um, just because you're not symptomatic doesn't mean you're not um, carrying that with you. So I, I know for us, if, if anybody, I know if, if one of us gets it, we're all gonna get it. Thank you, Bob. Can I Mrs. Mathis, just piggyback. Um, this is Katie Maring. I have um, Calvin going into fourth grade and Caroline going into sixth. Um, <clears throat> so I understand what the process is for, um, you know, if if our kids are sick and we need to call the office and let them know. Um, but when we're talking about if they're out, that that they're going to be able to get work from their teacher, is there a second? Like, are we making a phone call and an email to the teacher? Is there a time that I should expect that we would receive it? Like, <clears throat> I just feel like these, we obviously want to be able to, you know, do our work, but I also just feel like these teachers are going to be really, really stretched. <laughs> so what, how do we make this, how do we make this work? Patience, flexibility. Right. Um, so those are the the two that you know really come to mind. I I just pulled up the attendance uh, updates and recognized that uh, doing a screen share here and they're pretty exhaustive. <laughs> um, but I think you know our teachers are going to do the best they can to get in you know get work home to kids. Okay. Um, it might not be the same day, you know, that doesn't mean we're not going to try, but being flexible and understanding that, you know, if there are 29 kids in a classroom and seven are absent, um, it, you know, it's just going to take a little bit of extra time. It's, absolutely. I, I guess the question for me just is, what is the expectation of the parents? Like, is the office notifying the teachers or do we need to notify teachers separately? Oh, thank, thank you for clarifying, Katie. Once you contact the office to let us know that your child is absent, we can take the lead from there. Okay, great, thank you. I just don't wanna inundate the teachers with all of this, uh, <laughs> like they're getting all these emails and they're trying to teach and they're trying to do all the other things. So perfect, we will notify the office, thank you. Okay, thank you. I have a quick question if somebody, if you have a moment, I, this, my name is Jen, I am Kira, who's going into first grade's mom. If a child say before school starts or after a school break or during a school break, like a scheduled school break gets diagnosed or someone in that household gets diagnosed with COVID, obviously a first grader, you can send home homework packets to the Kazooie, but most of the learning there is more hands-on most of the time. What is the protocol there for them getting adequate amounts of education if they're in quarantine for two weeks because they tested 
or someone else in the household tested positive because last I had checked, they have to, to quarantine for around two weeks after the last day of quarantine if someone in their household came down with it. So that could be 24 days if the person prior has a 10 day quarantine. What, what do we do in that situation? Is there any flexibility? Is there any way where they can at least view the class that they're not able to attend? Well, I think that speaks to the, the remote um, in the event that we would need to go remote because more than one student in a class has um, a diagnosis or has been with someone with a diagnosis. The Department of Health guidelines are changing regularly, and that's where the uh, COVID handbook that's on the website is, is really a helpful resource. Mm -hmm. I think I understand what you're saying, Jen, you know, you don't, I would not want my first grader to be out of school for 24 days. Um, and I would worry about his or her education at that point. But, um, you know, there, we're not going to be able to make up all of the, the hands-on pieces of learning um, in that event. We're, we're going to do our best. We're going to hit the high points. We're going to hit the concepts that we know um, are critical concepts for that grade level. We're going to do our best. Okay. I was just curious because, you know, if they're gone for, say, a week over spring break or, you know, a couple weeks over Christmas break and they get sick over Christmas and test positive, so they're not even, or just a household member tests positive, then you still have that thing where they haven't exposed the whole classroom necessarily, but they've been exposed themselves. So that's just the concern. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hi, Mrs. Mathis. Uh, I'd like to jump in and ask a quick question. Yes. Um, I'm Kaylee. I'm John's mom. He's going into Ms. Cregan's class. Yep. And um, my question is just around, so I, while we were talking here, I was reviewing the handbook, and it's around if a kiddo exhibits a COVID symptom. Let's just, I'm going to use, for example, a runny nose, because they're really hard to differentiate, right? Um, I could, I would keep, the, I would keep my kiddo home for sure. Um, would, would he be required to get a negative COVID test prior to returning to school or what's the rule there? Is it 24 hours after symptoms um, clear up or could he come back if he had a negative COVID test but was still exhibiting a runny nose? It, questions that are, that are specific like this, Kaylee, uh, I wish I could answer, but I don't track the, uh, the Department of Health guidelines at, at that micro level, I really rely on our school nurse. And uh, also we do have a person who is a health room assistant. We have lots of flow charts. The best uh, thing I can think of is for us to get a flow chart on the website so that parents have, have a tool to, to you know, reference, you know, if runny nose and fever, stay home 24 hours, you know, negative COVID test, come back to school two weeks later, you know, I think if we had some sort of flow chart that might be helpful for, um, for more than one family. It definitely would, because the, the COVID handbook online doesn't, doesn't specify that stuff. Yeah, um. I think that's intentional. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank I'll you. see what we can do though. Michelle, I have a question. This is Heather Hoffmeister. Yes. Um, I know some schools, mostly private schools, have streamed the individual classrooms. Is that an option for, especially if, if there is a kid who isn't able to attend school for a week or two weeks, depending on what symptoms they display, to be able to at least um, join into the classroom? They might not be an active member, you know, participating, but they would be able to get the instruction um, along with the other kids. So they won't fall as far behind and they will be able to at least participate in, in that level. I, I've heard um, many other, many private schools are, are using that methodology. Um, at this time, uh, live streaming is, is not something that's Going, that is happening in Edmonds. I, I believe that's something that district level leadership and uh, leaders within 
the teachers union are, are discussing, but at this time, that's not an option. Okay, thank you. Uh, I have a question. Yes. Uh, this is Honor Bun. Uh, so I saw you had a slide about uh, COVID testing at school. Mm -hmm. uh, when or how does that happen? What's the process around that? Uh, that would be only with the parent's permission and parent's request. So if a parent were to request that uh, from our health room assistant, then we would work with the parent to, to provide that resource. But only with permission from the adult. And I understand it's only with the permission, but like, are there situations where you would reach out to parents for permissions or would parents bring their kids in for testing because they're presenting symptoms? Like I'm trying to understand what kind of processes, what kind of situations uh, would be uh, handled by this. I understand that per parents' permission is a requirement. Um, so it could go either way where um, we could, if a child was presenting symptoms, we could let the parent know that we do have the resource available to provide testing at school or a parent could reach out to us. So I think it could go either way. Michelle, I have a follow up question about that. Sure. Um, sorry, if, if you're done. Um, yeah, I'm done. Go ahead. Okay, sorry about that. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, it was mainly, I just wanted to know, and I apologize if this was said earlier and I missed it. Is it a PCR test or a rapid test that the district is using? Um, mainly just asking in terms of wanting to know ahead of time what the turnaround is for results. I do not have the answer to that, but I can find out. Okay, I mean, I'm fine with both. I was just mainly curious for my own knowledge. Thank you. It wasn't a service, uh, testing wasn't a service we were able to provide in the spring. So this is definitely something that I need to learn a little bit more about. And Michelle, if, if we have, you know, if, if we've done our due diligence and, you know, screened our kids at, at home in the morning and everybody's feeling good and, you know, great. And at some point, you know, in the middle of the day, Caroline starts coughing and every kid in her class freaks out because that's what is happening. Um, are, are we like, do these kids, if they don't feel sick, are they finishing the day or is the school calling me and saying, Caroline is, symptomatic potentially you need to come get her oh we've gone back to err on that side of caution where um we do have a a space where kids can go um if they're presenting symptoms that we did use in the spring and then we did contact parents uh to let them know but i try not to um how do i want to say this um Certainly, I don't want to shame any child for coughing. That's that's not uh, not something that we want to do, um, or or live in a world where we're all scared um, right. to be around someone who might look like they have a fever. Um, we we do uh, we did move kids to that safe safe place in the spring when they were presenting symptoms, and we did err on the side of caution and contact the parents. Okay. And then a follow up to that, what is the, um, what can families expect um, as far as like timeliness and what type of communication if, um, do we find out if a kid in my, you know, in say Calvin's class um, either stayed home because he didn't feel good or had a positive test or, tests are pending, like who's communicating with us and, and then sort of in what sort of timeline is, is that expected? Uh, so again, I'll reference the spring because that's really my only reference point. Um, the, the health department determines 
who is in close contact. So um, I provide the information about, you know, perhaps all of the students in the classroom. And the teacher might say, well, okay, um, you know, this student was working with four other people um, in the flex space on their project. So we'd really make sure that we call out that, you know, the student was with these four other kids. And then the health department um, makes contact or the health department did make contact with close contacts last spring. And we reached out to families uh, that same day if their child was presenting symptoms, you know, like priority number one, right away, get a hold of the families. Okay. And do we feel like now that we have, you know, more kids coming back into the classroom that the district has truly the resources for contact tracing like that? You know, we were such a small group of, you know, you were there two days a week and, mm -hmm. um, I'm just, I, I guess my question is, does, does the district actually have, have the resources in place to, to do this type of contact tracing? I can't speak to the systemic portion of, of the question. Um, you know, from, from this schoolhouse perspective, we were able to work closely with a liaison to uh, the, the health department and make those contacts within 24 hours. Uh, the kind of the little sticky part was where, you know, the health district defines close contact in one way and, you know, other people define it in other ways. So someone might be frustrated that they weren't contacted and they feel like they were a close contact, uh, but really that's a call that the health district makes. Okay, thank you. Can I share um, real quick? It might help some of the parents. Um, in the spring, my son had gone to school, was totally fine in the morning. And partway through the morning, I got a phone call saying, you got to come get your kid. And he had a quote, upset stomach and a, uh, he was tired. So I worked with the lady that was the health room assistant and she came out with paperwork, very clear paperwork, which I assume is from the Department of Health, explaining that there were primary COVID symptoms and secondary COVID symptoms. And he had two considered secondary symptoms. So I had to take him home. We came home. I am like 100% sure that he got car sick on the bus. <laughs> um, and he was totally fine. But she was, they were so thorough, so incredibly thorough. And obviously as a working parent that like, I'm, I'm a stay-at-home mom, so I was able to come get him, no problem. But uh, for working parents, I'm sure that could be frustrating. But I just wanted to say that everything she's saying, Ms. Mathis is saying about erring on the side of caution and the way that this gal handled it, I mean, I feel like they're doing the best they can. Because they were secondary symptoms, she said he was not required to get a COVID test. Um, of course, if anything materialized, then she said, please do and be in contact with us. He was fine with him being home for like an hour, but we kept him home the rest of the day. So I don't know if that helps at all, but it does seem like they have, like she was saying, kind of this flow chart and this real like specific way of hand handling it. And I was um, in the middle of a meeting. I actually work at, last year I was working as a pair at another school. And so I had to kind of juggle things around, but I said, well, I can be there in an hour. And they had to just like keep him in that little room. <laughs> so it wasn't like they sent him back to class or anything. So I don't know if that helps anybody. Um, but I assume things will probably be similar this year. But it, I mean, they were very organized and um, on top of it. And she had said at the time, it was towards the end of the school year. And they, she had told me the school could do the COVID testing. So I don't know if that wasn't like um, super, I don't think they talked about it a lot last year, but it sounds like they could do it if they wanted to um, there. And she said, if we wanted to come back and bring him back, they could do the testing right there um, at the school. So I don't know if that helps anybody, but I hope it does. It helped me. Thank you, Sydney. <laughs> uh, I have another question and maybe a bit of a nudge in there. Uh, is it possible for you to collect, uh, like, if parents agree, they could give you standing permission, like standing instructions that if needed, you can test their children uh, for COVID. And then if there are, you know, mild secondary symptoms, and I'm pretty sure there's going to be 
a lot of false positives here where uh, you could just take the kids, you can test them, wait for the results. And I, I have a home test kit here itself, which gives me the results in 20 minutes. So I'm sure you would be able to do that too. So then you don't have to call the parents uh, every time uh, somebody sneezes, right? At least for the kids for whom you have standing permissions like this. Like we could give you an authorization to test them whenever for the entire year. You just have to maintain the records. <laughs> I think there, there may come a time where there are more systems like that in place, but at this time, uh, we're not collecting that information. It would be on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. Hi, um, I have a quick question. I'm here uh, for Britannia and uh, Lul David, mm -hmm. um, their aunt. Um, correct me if I'm mistaken, but um, I heard you saying that there is a mass break area. If so, how are you gonna enforce that? Because um, I believe we all are having a conversation with them saying how to act and how to walk and take all the necessary precautions in the classroom and the uh, dining areas and everywhere. But the mask break area, will there be someone supervising them? Um, are, uh, will you have a number of kids? Um, there, is there a limitation in the number of kids that could be um, in the in that area? It's just, um, it's new for me. So I don't know how to have that conversation with the kids. So I would appreciate a little bit of insight. Thank you. Certainly, I'll, I'll speak to, um, again, what we what we were able to work with in this spring. Um, the mask break areas are completely outside. So those don't happen inside, they happen outside. And that's just a space where kids can go um, to really spread out, to not be next to anyone, and to just take that break that they need uh, for a few minutes. The, the kids, my experience last year was that the kids are really great about self-monitoring. Um, they, they understand the importance of wearing masks and um, just that developmental level, the, the rule followers. Um, but we do have staff members on the playground and we do have staff members who would be looking to remind kids to make sure they're correctly wearing their masks. Um, unless they're in that mask break area. And then, um, you know, that's just, it's a quick break, you know, just get some fresh air uh, without the fabric protector and, um, and then put your mask back on and go back and play. With, with that said, um, something I should have mentioned earlier is if it's possible to send a second mask with your child, that's really helpful. The masks do get a little gunky by midday. Hi, Michelle, can I ask a question? This is Jamie Clipper Hassan. Uh, Marina is gonna be a first grader. Um, the, the problem or the concern we have is even our uh, physician, his, his kids are grown, but I had asked his opinion about sending kids back to school and, and his biggest concern was the lunchroom, um, which, which I also worry about um, because Delta is so easily transmitted, so quickly transmitted, I, it, it feels almost like all the work of wearing masks all day is pointless when they then sit right across from each other and eat lunch without a mask. So will will there be, unless it's, what, what is the, the plan? Like, unless it's raining, will they be eating outdoors? Or do you have a plan for, you know, when they can eat outdoors and when, when you know, was it, is it most commonly going to be in that common room? A couple different points uh, to, to call out. Uh, the kids are actually all facing one direction in the commons, so they're, they're not seated across from each other, which feels very artificial, but it's necessary at this time. Uh, so that, that's one part. In terms of being outside, it'll probably be you know, where we'll have to stagger uh, different grade levels um, per week. Uh, just because if we have 
you know, all of the kindergarten through third grade kids eating outside, we're just moving one group, one large group from a space to a different space. So it would be more prudent perhaps to say, okay, you know, today, uh, this week, the third graders are going to eat outside every day that it's nice. And just um, try to approach the situation from, from that angle. Uh, last year, our fourth graders ate lunch outside every day. Um, and they went under the covered area if it was raining, but that was really because we just, we did not have the space we needed for uh, physical distancing. Uh, we'll try to get outside as much as we can, but it won't be the whole lunch group. It'll just probably be like a grade level at a time. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Can I, I wanna thank can I you. Chime in one last time. Pardon me. Can I chime in one last time, Michelle? How how uh, how much do you long for the days when you were asked about educational philosophy and <laughs> extracurricular activities instead of? Uh, oh, uh, <laughs> I, I do miss those days. <laughs> well, I, I do have a question though, but first I want to thank. I think it was Sydney who shared that story about her child. That that actually really did. Uh, help put my mind at ease. That was really nice to hear. I just want to thank her for sharing that. Uh, my, my question is, um, <laughs> uh, the one of the things I was kind of looking forward to, strangely enough, was doing that in class, you know, that weekly shift we do here. Again, this is my child's first year at Maplewood. It'll be, well, her first in-person year, let's put it that way. Um, and it sounds like I'm not going to get that, at least to start this year. Has that been um, sort of written off for the whole year? Or are you going to revisit that, like in the spring? Uh, how's that going to work? Yeah, I shared earlier um, in the presentation the importance family is uh, to me and, and family involved in education. So I think, you know, right now, because of the Delta variant, it's it's pretty safe to say that we, we're not going to be able to have volunteers in the classroom until at least the beginning of November. Um, you know, and then we get into cold and flu season. So there's, you know, another <laughs> dynamic, but um, I, I hope that there comes a time when we have volunteers back in the classroom, because that's what, that's what makes the school so special is when we have those, those cross general cross-generational relationships with our kids and families but for right now we just have to push pause yeah i know you can't say for sure but do you expect that to happen this year or are we looking at another year without it i don't have my magic crystal ball <laughs> personally i don't i just don't see things getting good enough soon enough yeah but i don't know I, I don't have long blonde hair and pigtails, so I'm not Pollyanna, but I, I sure would like to believe that there will come a time when we can have volunteers back in the classrooms this year. And I did just think of one last question with the, the vaccines for uh, age five to 12, looking likely that it's gonna be approved uh, by the end of the year, hopefully, if not shortly after the year. Um, has there been any word from the school district whether they will require vaccination once that happens? At this moment, I have not heard of a requirement for COVID vaccines for children. That could change tomorrow, but right now <laughs> at 7.10 on Monday night, I haven't heard of a requirement to that degree. I have two more questions. Two quick questions, sorry. Will the kids have access to the microwave this year for like the middle school students who get to do it a little different? And then um, will there be any option for field trips at all, even without parent support? Well, I would say let's um, again, err on the side of caution and, and not plan for the microwave to be there. Um, I'm old school bologna sandwich, you know, we just, there's mom put soup in the thermos and that's, you know, what it was. Um, so I would say, you know, let's plan to not use the microwaves. I know there are some circumstances for children, especially kids who are impacted by food allergies where that's just a necessity. Um, but I'd say, you know, let's plan on not using it. Uh, field trips, 
what I've read is that field trips are permissible. I, I think that um, we probably want to look at how can we live stream something in versus uh, sending our kids out right now, again, because of that Delta variant being just so deadly. Hi. Oh, I have, oh, go I, ahead. Sorry. sorry. I'm Maria Garcia, mom of Emma Lucas, my first year at Maplewood at all, um, kindergarten and second grade. I have a question and I don't know if this is something, does all the grades have lunch at the same time? No, there are three different lunch groups. Okay, that was my only question, thank you. Finally, I feel like I can answer a question, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's another non-COVID related one for you. Uh, which hopefully has an answer. Uh, so uh, other than the COVID vaccine, there's uh, general vaccination requirements for attending school, as I understand. Uh, I got an email about it too. Uh, do you, uh, are you able to just uh, get their vaccination records from the state information system uh, where their pediatric rep doctor reports it, hopefully? or do you need us to do something? Uh, we're, we're not able to uh, access healthcare information of, about children. We do rely on parents to provide that information for us. So what would we have to do? Uh, well, Karen Mitchell, who is our office support specialist, um, was mailing letters Friday and I think maybe a few today for mm -hmm. um, to families if their children or child uh, needed uh, something for, with, to do with vaccinations, if there was maybe a, an issue where there was not a vaccination that needed to happen. So I, um, I don't tend to work too much with medical records. Um, I think probably the best course of action would be contact Karen Mitchell. And if you didn't get a registered letter in the mail today or don't get one tomorrow, you're, you're in good shape. But you could call Karen Mitchell at 425-431-3002 um, and she would be able to help you. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, families, thank you so much for being here. Um, I want to just, again, uh, thank you for trusting us with your babies and for being partners in education. This, uh, the recording will go on the website tomorrow and uh, the slide deck is there now. And I will hang out for a few more minutes and try to answer questions. So thank you so much for your time this evening. There were 90 of us, so go Maplewood. Thank you. Thank you, Allison. Bye -bye. See you next week. <laughs> See you. Yeah. I, I have a question. Yes. That I think it's good that people are starting to drop off because it's um so we I lost my dad to COVID. And so my kids have, you know, struggled. They've seen the significant side of um COVID. And as a nurse at children's, I read every record and the psych unit is full of PTSD and all sorts of stuff um, due to this. So just as how much it's like really uh, dominated this conversation, I think I have a fear of what that's going to do to my oldest child um, when I'm guessing it's gonna be just as front and center at school. So are there emotional supports in place? Is there additional help in that regard? Yes. So. Um... Teachers will be uh, focusing on social emotional learning as well as the academic learning, making sure that kids are aware of their feelings, that they are, uh, they know that it's okay to have feelings of anger or sadness or joy or curiosity. And so that will be part of, that'll be embedded in daily instruction. Uh, focus on relationships. We, I think something that we do very well at Maplewood is our, our staff builds 
relationships with kids and um, just to be able to know them, to be able to say, looks like you have something on your mind today. Um, that is all complemented by uh, two school psychologists, uh, Ms. Sison, and then Ms. Sison will be joined by a part-time psychologist this year as well. So it's, you know, their, their lives have been upside down. I think about our kinders coming in and, you know, for almost half of their life, a third of their lives, they've lived in a pandemic. And um, it's nice to get out on the other side of that pandemic. All right, did you want to ask? Uh, Say, I have a question. I have a question. Yes, sir. You can introduce yourself. I'm Milo. I thought that was you, Milo. Now your question, buddy. Um, is the pool going to be here? Is the pool going to be open? Milo, that's a great question. The, the pool at Maplewood is not going to be open this year. I know, sad face. <laughs> right now it has about six inches of water in it. It needed to be drained uh, because we weren't able to use it last year. So, no. <laughs> Uh, unfortunately, the pool is not not an option right now. But great question. Yeah, sad faces all the way around. <laughs> hey, Michelle, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, I had to step away for just a minute while you talked briefly about recess. Um, Brady's really curious if the classes get to hang out together at his grade level or if he'll just be with his class. Uh, what Ms. Samioni was looking at today, Ms. Samioni is our student intervention coordinator and she really takes the lead on um, organizing recesses uh, for us. It will most likely be by grade level. Uh, okay. Because we, it's a small playground. <laughs> yeah. It's a small space and, and we really don't have, um, we can't divide it up by classes. So then we're looking at you know, locations and grade levels. And then it's yeah. kind of like, well, we've lost the cohorting by doing that. So no, this is good. This is what we wanted to hear actually. So all right, I've, I've um, got two questions. He, <laughs> yeah, he's, he was really hopeful that he'd be able to play with kids from the other class. So yeah. he'll be, he'll be glad to hear that. Thank you. I'll go um, ahead and have, put my contact information in the chat and um, hang out for a few more minutes. Uh, I have one question. Yes. Who will be the teacher for second grade? Because my little sister is in that grade. Oh, Bree, you're a good big brother. The <laughs> new second grade teacher's name is Miss Cragen. Okay, thank you. Yep. Uh, I have one question too. This is Theo. Hi, Theo. Um, What's your question? Are we going to be using our Chromebooks? Chromebooks. Yes. Okay. You'll have your Chromebook at school and then you'll take it home each day also. Okay, good deal. All right, thank you so much, everyone. I hope you have a good evening and I look forward to seeing you and your children soon. Go ahead and end the meeting for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.